Thank you. It's really great to be here. I'm so excited. Um, I actually was around at the beginning of YSC, at the birth of YSC, back way back in the day. And uh, it's just great to see all of you and see everything that's happening. We, we've been collaborating with YSC as well and trying to work on really the next step. So the first two talks were really great and precision medicine is great. But you all know it's not going to work without any collateral damage. <laughs> it's all going to have collateral damage. And one of the things that we're focused on now um, at the Dr. Susan Love Research Foundation is trying to document the collateral damage from some of these treatments because a lot of what um, doctors say and what doctors do it is based on trying to figure out if they can cure you or whether or keep you alive and that's great and and but it may not be enough um, I on June 12th um, uh, 2012 I had gone for a run the night before I went to work I went down to UCLA because the rheumatologist I was seeing for some arthritis stuff was retiring and I wanted her to refer me to somebody new and she did a whole lot of blood tests like they always do because they don't know what else to do when they're rheumatologists and then she, and then she sent me um, back, and then I went home, back to the office. And I was at the office, and I got a phone call from my primary care doctor saying, I have shocking news for you. You have 30% blasts in your blood. And if you come right back to UCLA, we can do a bone marrow right now. So I packed my stuff up and was heading back to UCLA. Now, I'm a surgeon. And blood is not, we only spill it. We don't study it. <laughs> we, we, we don't, I don't know about blood. That's not one of the things you can do surgery for. So I'm thinking, blast? What are blasts again? What does that mean? Even though you're a, a specialist and you've done cancer your whole life, it doesn't mean that when somebody tells you that um, you have it, that all of the knowledge you go di disappears, and you never get a kind of cancer that you know about anyway. <laughs> so, uh, so I got back there, and I had a bone marrow, and I had a sort of asshole oncologist um, who, there, there are good ones like we just heard from, and there are not so good ones, and even when you're a doctor, you still can find the bad ones, who said, well, this was a Thursday, you know, maybe we'll have the results next week, and I said, Bullshit. The slides are out tomorrow. You go look at them yourself. You're an oncologist. You're a hematologist. Call me. So he did. But um, <laughs> now, it's unfortunate that you guys don't always know that the slides are out the next day, next afternoon. So um, and and I found out I had leukemia. I had um, AML. And uh, so again, not one I knew anything about, um, completely new. I ended up uh, in the hospital with um, uh, a chemotherapy. I was in the hospital for seven weeks. I went home for a week, and then I had a bone marrow transplant from my baby sister, who luckily was a, a, a complete match, and uh, was in the hospital after that with all the collateral damage and the chemo and uh, mucositis and neuropathy, and I don't even want to. Luckily, I don't remember any of it because I got so many narcotics for the pain <laughs> that it's, it's a complete blur in my mind, and I only have some stories from my family who were around and, and there for me. And I finally you know, got out, and here I am, and I'm now two and a half years later, which in leukemia, <laughs> that's good. Um, but so. I learned a lesson in this. I learned a lot of lessons, as we all know when we go through this experience like this. But one of the lessons I learned from having been a doctor and then a patient like this is the great divide. Because doctors compare you to the people who died. And so they're patting themselves on the back because you're alive. And they think, what are you complaining about? You're here. And we compare ourselves to how we were before treatment. And we're acutely aware of the price that we had to pay to be here. And they really don't want to know. I mean, I've had some doctors say to me, you know, I don't want to know about anything I don't know how to treat. 
So I don't ask about it because I don't know what to do about it and I don't wanna, I don't wanna feel incompetent, so I just don't ask. And I think that happens, it's don't ask, don't tell, most of the time for a lot of the collateral damage. And so it was a lesson to me that we were really missing out a lot on trying to figure this out. And so the first thing I did was to test whether I was just making, th it was just me, or whether this was real. And the great thing about the internet is you can find out really fast. So in August of, of 2013, we decided to check and we put up a website and we put out the call to the Army of Women and everybody on our Facebook page and Twitter and said, tell us your side effects about treatment. And I'm sure some of you helped us with this. And we said, use it in the form of a question, like Jeopardy, because I didn't want a paragraph. <laughs> so I figured if I told people to just do a question, they'd say, why do I have? And then I'd find out what it was, as opposed to the whole description, um, which we didn't want. So we got a lot of questions. Within 24 hours, we had 1,100 um, responses. Um, will I ever have the energy to go a full day without a nap? Will I stop forgetting things? A lot of them were questions that, um, and complications and side effects that people know about, but um, some of them were things that nobody had ever, uh, I had never heard about before. And a lot of them were things that really um, surprised me, like when am I gonna have sensation in my reconstructed breast again? And of course the answer to that is never. Did nobody tell you that? You know, and, and um, or why don't you, you know, and some of these things are things that people should have known and nobody told them. So it showed me there really was a need that it wasn't just me that, that had um, collateral damage and had these problems. So I reached out to the Young Survival Coalition, my, my, one of my first calls, because I know that the, that the collateral damage in the young survivor population is different than the collateral damage in the old survivor coalition, the old fogies. We have a whole different set, not any worse or better, but different. And we reached out to Komen, and we said, we're gonna do this um, website, we're gonna call it Question the Cure, and we're gonna um, ask people to give us their collateral damage. And so we made a project-specific website. We had participants to provide their treatment-related concerns. And then we went to all the other groups that I knew or could find or could find somebody to email or call. And they, these are all the ones that, um, just some of them that collaborated with us that I could get steal their logo from the internet. That's really what determined whether you got on that. So, <laughs> on that slide, however, uh, we had lots of groups, we put it out very widely, and we said, give us your collateral damage, and we had more than 9,000 questions. And we had comments from more than 3,200 people who had breast, with a history of breast cancer that were collected. So some people put more than one comment in. Um, but not surprisingly, because many people have more than one kind of collateral damage. So this is just a little of the first, this is the first crowdsourcing and this just shows you some of the percentages of, of some of the problems. And they're not, not there's, some of them are not a big surprise. Fatigue, chemo brain, anxiety and depression, sexual problems, numbness, lymphedema, early menopause. Um, but some of them, uh, vision changes, smell and taste changes, things that really balance and weakness that are not as commonly talked about or, or thought about, and a lot of others. Um, and so the phase two of the collateral damage project was to better quantify the, the collateral damage. So that's all well and good to just put out a call and get all these questions, um, but can we do it in a way where we can really look at it more carefully? And we have a study that we call the Health of Women Study. And the Health of Women Study is an ongoing cohort study where we periodically send out questionnaires or tell you about questionnaires. You go to a website, you fill them out. Some of them are endless. Um, but they ask you all kinds of things from your family history, your other diseases, your environmental exposures we've done, um, your exercise, things like that. So all of those things. But we hadn't really done um, the, the quality of life. 
And we opened it, so we did a, a, a used, you know, what they call validated questionnaires, not just crowdsourcing. And we put them in, and we had everybody, asked everybody in the Health of Women study to fill it out. And that way, we could look at not only their collateral damage, but we could compare it to what drugs they were on, or what kind of chemo they had, or what other diseases they had. And we, as of February 2015, we had 10,351 have completed the questionnaire. It's still open, so if you want to, you can go do it at healthofwomenstudy.org. Don't go to healthofwomen.org. I'm told it's a Japanese porn site. Um, <laughs> but go, go to healthofwomenstudy.org, and you can fill out all the questionnaires, or you can just fill out the quality of life questionnaire. And 2,700, I'm going to tell you the results from the young women. We did it, we did the cutoff under 50. Uh, but 2,760 were under 50, and of those, 517 were breast cancer survivors. So you can up that number a lot if the, oh, those of you that haven't done it get on the stick when you get home or tonight or while you're sitting through a boring talk as opposed to this one. Um, <laughs> uh, you can do it online. Of the women under 50, you can see the majority of them were actually 45 to 49. We need more younger ones. The majority of them, we, we when you do an, inter, an internet online thing, you always skew towards uh, white, um, having gone to uh, college and professional, um, and most of them are married. So again, all any of you who have access to other populations, we would love to get a more diverse um, sample. The top problems under the women under 50 were uh, concentration was 5, 44%, sleeping 49%, hot flashes 52, memory and remembering 52%, and tiredness and fatigue was the top one. So those were the top five from our preliminary, but that's only 517 women. So you know we can get better data uh, the more people we have. I just want, because with, uh, the one big thing I noticed from my chemo is chemo brain is just killing me. Um, I can do work really well, but I can't remember what I did yesterday. Uh, <laughs> um, but 44% uh, um, had chemo brain, mood swings, nervous and anxiety, depression, memory remembering 52% and sleeping problems and restlessness. And the problem is a lot of this isn't getting to the, to the doctors. And then there's the financial collateral damage, which is not insignificant. So that when you look at this, a severe problem, 11% um, were having career problems, 10% not being able to change jobs because they were going to lose their health insurance, almost 10% being less able to provide for their family. So I think that's a, an area of collateral damage, too, that is often underlooked, and I'm glad Dr. Dizen mentioned it. Um, so the next steps for, for Question the Cure are to clean and analyze all the data. We need to clean it, so that means you want to make sure that if somebody said, that they'd never been pregnant on one part and then in another part said that they had three kids, somebody has to look and decide which one are we going to believe um, and how to make it all consistent. Uh, and then what we want to do is do look at some of the clues as to why some people get some side effects and not others. So do people with restless leg syndrome get more uh, neuropathy? Maybe. You know, they're both nerve things. Or do people who have um, Alzheimer's in their family have more um, chemo brain than people who don't have Alzheimer's? Maybe. And if we could start to figure that out and predict both in terms of maybe not just the drugs, but also the, you know, the other things in people's lives, we might be able to then make suggestions to doctors about what to do better or what to be aware of or what to, what, uh, how to do things differently. Because the problem is when you do a clinical trial, they're great, and I do think everybody I don't, should be in clinical trials, but they only, you know, they're big studies, and they're only collecting, um, they, they don't want to collect a lot of side effects. So they're going to collect the common things that they're expecting, but they're not going to collect data on the outliers, on the weird people who have um, side effects that they haven't heard of. And so the only way we're going to capture those is by going to all of you. And in fact, you know, we talk about patient-reported outcomes, but patient-reported outcomes up till now are pretty much the patient filling out a questionnaire that was made by a doctor. 
So it doesn't always capture your experience. It captures what the researcher or the doctor thinks your experience is going to be. And that's the lesson I learned. It's, there's often a big disconnect between those two. And so um, our other step that we want to do when we get some funding is to um, put out an open questionnaire where people could write whatever they want. So you, it'll be in your words. You can tell us what the collateral damage is. And then there are ways of analyzing that. And that's, that will be more patient reported. And then we we'll also want a way to share the data with researchers and also participants so that you could get a good idea. And you could say, you know, I wonder if anybody else is this. And you could go look in the database and put in two variables and be able to see, well, 60% of other people had complained of of you know, this, and then you'd, you'd at least know. So you can sign up and be part of the Health of Women study. You can also be part of the Army of Women. The Army of Women, for those of you who don't know, is you just sign up and give us your email. And what you're signing up for is us sending you emails about research studies that are being done that are looking for participants. So they're looking, some of them are clinical trials, some of them are not. Some of them are, they're all variety of things. And we don't match because we found out that if you collect a lot of data with people and you only send you know, this study to the people who you know got this drug on this day and had, have three kids and live in New York, then you're only going to get those people. And those things change. Maybe by next week they'll have four kids instead of three kids. And they haven't changed their, their profile and then they're not eligible anymore. So instead what we do is we just e-blast it out to everybody. And then you may or may not fit, but if you don't fit, then you send it on to your friend in Indianapolis who's a perfect match. So we found that things go out much further um, and we get much more reach by sending them to everybody. And it also lets you know the kind of research that's going on. And you may not fit all of it, but at least you know what's happening. So Army of Women, and then if you want to fill out questionnaires, I know that's not everybody's cup of tea, health of women study, particularly the quality of life. And you can do the quality of life without doing all of them, although we'd prefer you do all of them. So what, we want, what I want to do, my, my goal is to find the cause of breast cancer and end it. That's what I really want to do. And, and we're doing research on that, and we can do it. You know, people look at me and think I'm totally crazy. But in my, and I am, but in my professional life, I have seen it. When I started, if you had an abnormal pap smear, you had a hysterectomy, because we didn't know what else to do. You lost your fertility, because we didn't know how else to prevent cancer of the cervix. And I have a cousin who was, had an abnormal pap smear, and they told her she needed a hysterectomy. She'd never had a kid. And she said, just a minute, give me time. And they gave her a year. She went out, found a guy, got married. She was Catholic, so she had to get married. Got pregnant, <laughs> had the kid, and then they did the hysterectomy. Subsequently, they got divorced. Um, but <laughs> it lasted a few years. But at any rate, <laughs> but that was all we had. You lost your fertility because of an abnormal pap smear. And then we figured out it was sexually transmitted. Well, then we figured out you could do cryo or core biopsies and do less and save the, your fertility. And then we figured out it was sexually transmitted. And then we figured out that it was a virus. And now we have a vaccine. So in my lifetime, and in many of yours, we went from taking out normal body parts to prevent a disease to having a vaccine. That's amazing. That's really amazing. We can do that for breast cancer. I mean, what are we doing now? What did Angelina Jolie have? We took off her normal body parts, because that's the only prevention we know right now. And that is a very crude way to prevent a disease. So we're trying to figure that out. There's lots of, way, lots of things we're working on, and I'll be happy to talk to you. But in order to do that, and in order to sort of change the big ship of breast cancer, from pink awareness, um, get your mammogram, and, and, um, and, and then everything will be great, sort of the pink haze of survivorship, that in order to change that to let's find the cause and end it, we have to show that there's a price to the cure, that even if you're cured, you pay a price for that cure. Um, uh, from side effects, from chemo brain, from all that. It's great to be here. 
I'm really happy I had all the availability of the drugs I had, but I would have much rather not have had cancer in the first place. And so, so we hope that with our work, we hope you'll work with us. We're, we work closely with the Young Survival Coalition on a, on a lot of um, issues, and we hope to continue to do that. And, and, and my promise to you is that I'm going to keep on plugging until I can find the cause and end this disease once and for all. Thank you. <laughs>